You know, it's not immediately self-evident why a banker, even one as successful and as resistant to accepting government assistance as John Allison is, should be invited to address the Federalist Society. But understanding just why it is so appropriate for the retired chairman and, and chief executive officer of bb and Bank to join this group this morning requires little more than revisiting the society's own description of its reason for being. As I'll remind you, law schools, to quote, and the legal profession are currently dominated by a form of orthodox liberal ideology which advocates a centralized and uniform society. And while some members of the academic community have dissented from these views, by and large, they are taught simultaneously as if they were law. Now, substitute for law schools in those phrases, departments of economics, history, and many others, and one begins to get a sense of the importance of non-banking work that John Allison has done and what has motivated him and the bb and Foundation to become involved specifically in higher education. Just as the teaching of the law has been skewed by ideology, so have the workings and value of our free market economic system been either overlooked or treated with skepticism by the academy more broadly. Not universally, but more broadly. This is not, I should hasten to add, a subject unrelated to the law. Indeed, the rule of law and the property rights it serves to ensure are, of course, essential to healthy markets. John Allison well understands, moreover, that neither financial institutions nor the customers to whom they extend credit can thrive or even survive when regulation goes too far, in keeping with the discussion of the first panel, when government goes beyond its core functions and instead begins to dictate how capital should be allocated or worse, takes it upon itself to make the allocation decision directly. Yet, just as it is with the role of the courts, higher education has a great deal of influence on the course that government ultimately takes, not least because the views of citizens are so much shaped by their time on campus. And it's with all this in mind that Mr. Allison, working through the bb and Foundation, has provided support to no fewer than 60 programs at colleges and universities around the country, from Appalachian State to Boston College, for the study of the moral foundations of capitalism. That means the study, and indeed often the reintroduction, of the seminal works of Ayn Rand and Adam Smith. Incredibly, as my Manhattan Institute colleague Charlotte Allen discovered in researching her recent essay on the topic for the Weekly Standard, it is literally more common for first-year students to be assigned the books of Barbara Ehrenreich, such as Nickel and Dime in America, with its focus on the exaggerated woes of those who work at modest occupations that she herself disdains, than the assignment of the Wealth of Nations, Atlas Shrugged, or the Theory of Moral Sentiments. In John Allison's view, this should not stand. And just like those who undertook to found and build the Federalist Society, he's doing something about it planting beachheads far and wide. We at the Manhattan Institute have been inspired by his example, as you'll see in the materials for our project, which we call subtly Capitalism on Campus, in which we're un undertaking to bring back full and nuanced instruction in political economy to the academy, whether through uh, uh, new freestanding centers or courses in economics, history, and liberal arts uh, overviews. Indeed, following in the footsteps of the Federalist Society, we'd love to see Adam Smith's societies begin to proliferate on campus. Uh, our new initiative is uh, a subset of work we're already doing in our Center for the American University, which includes fellowships to uh, uh, professors in 15 schools and a web magazine called Minding the Campus. We'll be pretty pleased, I must note, if we can match the record of our speaker this morning in reaching 60 schools. Not many can match John Allison's record as a banker, either. When he became the CEO of BB&T in 1987, he had just $4.7 billion in assets. By the time he retired in December of 2008, he'd overseen the acquisition and successful integration of 60, there's that number again, uh, banks and savings institutions. Both through those acquisitions and the organic growth of prudent business practices, BB&T has become the 10th largest bank in the nation with $152 billion in assets. What's more, it continues in its own business practices to embody John Allison's belief in limited government. In June of 2009, the Charlotte Observer reported that, quote, 
seven months after it being was strongly urged to accept $3.1 billion from the federal government, BB&T Corporation, a longtime opponent of big government, repaid the money along with $93 million in interest. We know that far too often America's business leaders today feel the need to apologize for such success or talk down the free enterprise system that made that success possible. And too often, foundations which draw their assets from such success do the same. John Allison has resisted those temptations and will, I hope, be an exemplar for other business leaders. John Allison is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of North Carolina. He received his master's degree in management from Duke University. He's now a distinguished professor of practice at the Wake Forest School of Business. In 2009, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from American Banker, and he was recognized by the Harvard Business Review as one of the last decade's top 100 most successful chief executives in the world. Please join me in welcoming the former chairman of the BB&T Corporation, John Allison. Thanks, Howard. Good morning. Real uh, pleasure to be here. I always enjoy the opportunity to talk to uh, bright young people who will be future leaders in our society. And in this room, we do have a group of people that are going to make a big difference, a big difference. I do uh, want to talk to you today about the financial crisis, which I'll admit is not the most fun subject to talk about, but it's a very important issue, not, a, not because of the economic consequences, but because of the long-term policy decisions which have been made, which will have a profound influence on the quality of your life. And also because there's a lot of misunderstanding about what happened. In fact, we heard some of the, uh, this morning, some of the, the assumptions made and the follow-up to those assumptions that will have even more policy uh, ripples. I want to share with you four basic ideas. Uh, the financial crisis was primarily a result of government policies. We do not live in a free market in the United States. We live in a mixed economy. That mixture varies a lot by industry. Technology is probably 80% free, 20% government. Financial services is probably 70% government, 30% free. It is not surprising that the most regulated segment of our economy is where we had the biggest problems. Secondly, government policies resulted in a bubble, which means a massive misinvestment uh, in our economic system, primarily in the residential real estate market. That bubble deflated, as all bubbles do, destroying trillions of dollars of wealth and destroying millions of jobs. Thirdly, a number of major financial institutions made serious mistakes. If I'd been in charge, I'd allowed them to fail. Uh, however, those mistakes were secondary and were in the context of government policy errors. And finally, and maybe most significantly for this group, almost everything we've done since this crisis started, even things that may help in the short term will reduce our standard of living in the long term. What happened? We built too many houses. We invested over uh, a trillion dollars, probably two trillion dollars too much in residential real estate. We built too many houses. We built too big of houses. We built houses in the wrong place. Uh, we should have been invested in technology, manufacturing capacity, education. We should have saved more. How did we make a mistake of that magnitude? Oops. Uh, an error of that size can only happen through errors in government policy. And there's no question that the three primary uh, drivers for errors made by the Federal Reserve, uh, by the FDIC, by government housing policy, and specifically Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, the giant government-sponsored enterprises, and then secondarily by the S SEC. The fundamental cause of the financial crisis, and by the way, this is relevant to what's happening today, were errors made by the Federal Reserve. Um, many people that have studied economics or just taken a basic economics course know this, but they don't integrate what this means. In 1913, the monetary system in the United States was nationalized. We do not have a private monetary system. We have a government-owned, government-controlled monetary system. If you have problems in the monetary system, which is where our financial challenges came from, by definition, they're problems uh, of government policy. It would be like the interstate highway bridge is falling down. Everybody knows the government owns the highways. It would be the government's problem. The government owns and controls the monetary system. The Federal Reserve was created in theory to reduce volatility in the economic system. In practice, and there's a lot of studies that, uh, that uh, show this, in practice what they did have done is reduce volatility in the short term and created bigger problems in the long term. In a free market, because we are not omniscient, markets are constantly correcting. 
Businesses are failing, new businesses are being created. In fact, markets are really an experimentation process. For every Google, there are 10,000 failed Googles. They're an experimentation process. When you take out the downside of the experimentation process, when businesses can't fail, all you do is push the problems into the future. In addition, the very existence of the Federal Reserve has magnified leverage in our economic system. A state can borrow you a lot of money because it can, it can tax. However, a state runs into a limit, California's probably hit that limit, on how much it can borrow, uh, but the federal government can borrow you a lot more because it can print money. In fact, it can almost borrow inf infinitely because it not only can tax, it can print money. Between the time of the creation of the United States till uh, the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, there was no inflation in the U.S. economy. From 1913 to the day, we've had 2,000 percent inflation. Well, there's an interesting reason for that. If you're a big debtor, like the federal government, you want inflation to pay back with, with cheaper dollars. That's why they get so ex excited about deflation. You know, falling prices is not necessarily the worst thing that you can buy stuff cheaper, not necessarily the worst thing that happened, unless you happen to be a huge, huge debtor. Um, and then there were some very big errors, and, and these errors are pretty documental, uh, made by uh, Alan Greenspan and Bernanke in managing uh, interest rates during the 10-year uh, the, the, the period that preceded the economic correction. Uh, Greenspan, uh, in the early 2000s, created what's called negative real interest rates. And that means you could borrow money at 2% and inflation was running about 3%. Cr cannot create a bigger incentive to borrow. And then Bernanke raised interest rates 425% in two years. Very difficult to do economic calculation when price is going up 425% in two years. In addition, he created what's called inverted interest rates. A bank borrows short and lends long. When inverted interest rates, short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. That created negative margins in the banking business and created huge incentives for financial institutions to take a lot of risk. It's, no, it's not surprising that banks, the, the bad loans were all made in a very short period of time when, invert, when there was inverted in, interest rates. Interesting thing about the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve has a lot of very smart people, uh, they're very bright people, they have very sophisticated financial models, but they're guilty of something called fatal uh, conceit, uh, defined by the great free market economist Frederick Hayek, and fatal conceit is the belief of smart people that they can do in the impossible. There is no way to integrate the economic activity of 7 billion people on the planet. They simply can't do it. The Federal Reserve is really in the business of fixing prices. What we know from economic studies is fix, price fixing never works uh, because you simply can't get all the information to, to, to integrate and come up with the right price. In a fundamental sense, we couldn't possibly have had a bubble unless the Federal Reserve printed the money to make it happen. Second factor, FDIC. Sounds like a good thing, FDIC insurance. Unfortunately, it destroys market discipline. Uh, we saw that in our operations in Atlanta, a market where a lot of community banks have failed. We took over one of those community banks, and it's a very typical story. Uh, ten guys get together. They're all in the motel business. They raise a little capital. They leverage that capital by buying certificates of deposits at above market interest rates. The depositors don't care because they got government insurance, right? They lent that money to their cronies. The cronies all went broke, and the FDIC lost 50 cents on the dollar. On a bigger scale, IndyMac, Washington Mutual, Countrywide, all large financial institutions, built nationwide franchises, all basically failed, all financed high-risk loan portfolios by paying high rates on certificates of deposits, relying on FDIC insurance. Without that insurance, they couldn't have financed those high-risk loan portfolios. Proximate cause of the uh, financial crisis is government housing policy, and this goes back a, a long time where the government has tried to subsidize home ownership. Uh, under the theory that home ownership is a good thing. They've tried to raise the percentage of people that own homes above what's called the natural market rate. What is, it, home ownership's a good thing in a certain context. However, there's no evidence that home, owning a home actually changes human behavior. It's the behaviors such as savings and discipline that cause people to own homes that are good, uh, the good thing. And encouraging people to buy houses they can't afford or young people to buy too big a houses is, is definitely not a good thing to do. Um, the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, which happened back in the 1970s, was kind of the, the moral foundation of, of this process. But the big event was an interesting event, and I remember it well because I was in the bank, running a bank at that time, was a decision made by Bill Clinton in September of 1999 where he set a goal for Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, these giant government-sponsored enterprises, to have a, half their loan portfolio in affordable housing now called subprime lending. Interestingly enough, a number of economists, including liberal economists, said, wow, this is risky. The legitimate affordable housing market is not that big, and if Freddie and Fannie reach that goal, it could jeopardize their financial well-being, and they're so big, if they fail, they could take out the whole U.S. economic system, and it could happen in 10 years. Nine years later, it happened. 
Uh, when Freddie and Fanny, uh, well, actually, but literally before they went broke, Freddie and Fanny were leveraged a thousand to one. They had a thousand dollars of debt and every dollar in equity. The only way they could do that is because the government guaranteed their debt. They never could have existed in the free market. They, they could not possibly exist in the free market. When they went broke, they owed five trillion dollars that you now owe. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Of that $5 trillion, $2 trillion of it was affordable housing, subprime lending. They absolutely dominated the subprime market. They dwarfed the private competitors in the marketplace. They were the big driver in the subprime marketplace. Politics played a huge role in Freddie and Fannie. I was personally on the committee of the Financial Services Roundtable of the 100 largest banks for nine years trying to do something about Freddie and Fannie. And we met with Congress on numerous occasions uh, with people like Barney Frank, who I call the evil one. Uh, <laughs> And, and, the, the, re, the reason I, I think he's evil is he's smart. Uh, most of these guys had no idea what was going on. They, they, they didn't get to that status, but he was smart enough to know something. But guess what? We had the facts. Anybody in this room, 15-year-old, looking at the facts, said, boy, Fred and Fanny are going broke. They absolutely wouldn't hear us. And why was that? First, they had, a, I'd call it a religious belief in affordable housing. It was such a good thing. And secondly, Freddie and Fannie were huge political contributors. They were big contributors of the Republican Party and the biggest contributor to the Democratic Party. So they absolutely evaded and watched Freddie and Fannie fail. In a simple but fundamental sense of the word, what really caused the financial crisis is the Federal Reserve printed too much money. It ended up in a bubble of huge, massive misinvestment in residential real estate because of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and the affordable housing uh, programs that Congress sponsored. Uh, just quick background, I don't know how much economics everybody knows. Why do banks exist in the first place? The, the, the reason that banks exist is to pool risk, credit risk, interest rate risk, liquidity risk. And what it does is allow an, an economic system to make longer term investments. Simple example, uh, a residential builder wants to build a subdivision to put lots in and build houses. It's going to take him five years to build them and, and sell them. He needs $50 million, too small to go to the capital markets, too big to go get his friends. He comes down to a bank. A bank can finance that subdivision and a bunch of other subdivisions and finance people buying cars and manufacturing plants. It can diversify its risk. It allows an economic system to make a longer term term investment. There are no healthy economies without healthy banking systems. Uh, however, there's an intrinsic problem in the design of the banking system. Banks intrinsically borrow short and lend long. That's how they, they make money. A solvent bank has got plenty of money to pay people, but it doesn't necessarily have cash in its hands. So there's always a solvency issue in the banking. There's always a, a liquidity issue in the banking system, even though there shouldn't be a solvency issue. One interesting thing, and I'll come back to this, an interesting decision that was made early on in this crisis that contributed some material to the crisis was the decision by the Federal Reserve to save Bear Stearns. Bear Cerns was a mid-sized uh, investment banking firm. It could have failed. If it had have failed, the market would have gotten one message. The market got a very different message when Bear Cerns was saved. The message was the government's going to bail everybody out because there's no way Bear Cerns was essential to the overall economy. Banks are leveraged about 10 to 1. That means they have $10 of debt for every dollar in equity. Investment banks are leveraged 30 to 1. They have $30 of debt in every dollar in equity. In my career, banking leverage has increased. Why is that? The Federal Reserve manages the capital ratios. The Federal Reserve wants to inflate the money supply. The way they practically do that is through banks. They've actually encouraged banks to raise their leverage positions. Investment banks increase their leverages dramatically after their traditional model was attacked by Elliott Spitzer and they started trading on their own, on their own, own risk. Before there was a Federal Reserve, by the way, banks were only leveraged one to one. How did the, how did the real estate markets get into the capital markets? How does that happen? If you look at residential real estate prices, ultimately they're driven primarily by affordability because uh, you have to be able to afford the houses. At the peak of the residential bubble in the U.S., housing prices based on affordability on average were about 30% too high. Now that varied a lot. In Southern California, they were 60% too high. And once the state of North Carolina, where I live, they were probably 15% too high. Uh, so they had to fall. And the, when the bubble started deflating, they fell. They fell about 20% initially. Banks were financing housing, investment banks financing housing. That destroyed about $500 billion in capital in the banking business. Remember, banks are leveraged 10 to 1, investment banks are 30 to 1, we'll just use banks at 10 to 1. If you destroy $500 billion in capital, you f destroy $5 trillion in liquidity, particularly the ability of banks to lend to each other. Lots of lockups in the back, the back room of banking systems. Banks scrambled to raise capital. They raised about $200 billion, but they still were $300 billion short, so there's a $3 trillion liquidity problem in the banking industry. 
Markets are getting antsy. The markets have figured out price prices need to fall some more. You know, if they fall 30, down to 30%, that's another $100, $150 billion in capital. That's another trillion, trillion and a half dollars in liquidity. Markets are antsy, but they're still functioning. Then the regulators made a very interesting, very destructive, under-discussed decision. The Treasury, Federal Reserve, FDIC uh, decided to do a special, we can call this a rule of law event, when they, when they handled Washington Mutual. Washington Mutual, $300 billion institution, it's failing. In order to um, keep there from being uh, a fear in the economy, they decided to, to do something that's not normal. That in the past, when a bank fails, insured depositors get 100 cents on the dollar, but the uninsured depositors get some kind of haircut, 50%, 75%. In this case, they decided to pay the uninsured depositors 100 cents on the dollar. What that did was kill the bondholders in the bank. The bondholders knew they had a loss, but their loss was magnified because the FDIC arbitrarily chose, chose to take the bondholders' money and give it to the uninsured depositor. Just decided to do that one day. Uh, now, the, the reason they did that was when Indy Mac failed, there was a run on the bank and it showed up on newspapers and they were afraid this would cause other runs. You can make an argument whether it would or wouldn't, but they could have easily decided to take the loss in the FDIC insurance fund. That's what the insurance fund exists for instead of passing it on to the bondholders. Well, once the bondholders couldn't figure out what their loss was going to be, if any institution failed, the capital markets just closed. But bb t had been in the capital markets a week before this happened, had no trouble issuing capital. Day after this happened, no bank could issue capital. Wachovia fails two days later. They probably were going to fail anyway, but this definitely pushed them pushed him over the cliff. This is why Bernanke and Paulson were so panicky. Not over Lehman Brothers. It's because they had closed the capital markets uh, for banks. Of course, housing was overbuilt. Lots of the rest of the world and, and international institutions were investing heavily in the U.S. So our, our uh, crisis. And also, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. If the, if the Federal Reserve makes errors in printing too much money, it gets translated globally because we are the reserve. It's happening right now. Uh, we're, tra we're translation inflation all over the world, no matter what Bernanke says, because we are the reserve currency of the world. Um, interesting thing, how did the subprime crisis end up, and this kind of gets to a bigger issue, how did it end up making such a big deal? If you look at the subprime market outside of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and by the way, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae lied. They, didn't say that, they said they had none, and we figured out they had two trillion, so that was not good. Anyway. Um, <laughs> The, the, how, how would that take, it's not big enough. If you liquidated it for nothing, it wouldn't take out the, the global financial system. Well, what it did, it identified a bigger problem. A lot of the subprime debt had been securitized, sold in the capital markets based on ratings from Standard Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch. Now, these, these three entities have a, a legal oligopoly created by the federal government. They're the only people who can rate financial instruments that are sold in a certain kind of pension funds. They're supposed to know what they're doing, uh, and they missed. And they didn't miss a little bit. They, these bonds were rated AAA and they were F. It wasn't just a little miss. Uh, what happened, as soon as the market figured out they couldn't trust Standard Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch, it, it went all over other places because the whole information system had collapsed in the capital markets. Uh, an example that, that we were involved in actually may have been, in, I don't know if it wouldn't have hit in the University of Virginia, but I'm sure it hit colleges, I know it hit colleges in Virginia. There was a market called the auction rate municipal bond market where tax uh, exempt entities, typically entities that couldn't tax, like universities and hospitals, airport authorities, had issued long-term bonds with short-term interest rates to finance long-term projects. They built a new wing to the hospital and they did it on either a variable rate or these bonds had to be re refinanced. They were all uh, uh, rated based on insurance from two companies called MB, AMBAC and MBIA who had traditionally been in the municipal bond issues but also insured lots of subprime mortgages. And even though these companies remained AAA, the market quickly figured out, and of course they weren't, that they, they weren't AAA, so they couldn't trust the insurance policies. So I'm sitting over in, in Hong Kong, and I'm an investor in the hospital in Emporia, Virginia. And I've got a bond that's AAA rated because it's insured by AMBAC, and I know AMBAC's not AAA rated. I have no idea about the, the, what the hospital is worth in, in Emporia, Virginia. So I'm going to sell my bond at any price. So, so interest rates go up to 50% uh, for universities, hospitals uh, on, on these instruments. Not because they, the end, entities were in trouble, but because of the lack of information in the marketplace. Now, it's, it's interesting thing what happens in a liquidity crisis. There's a huge flight to quality. bb t was buried with cash. We were literally having people pay us to take their money. That was interesting, uh, buried with cash. We were able to do $6 billion in financing for entities like a, the hospital in Emporia uh, to help them through that kind of financial crisis. 
Fair value accounting, you may have heard about that. This is a relatively new accounting rule, particularly as it's implemented. Now, we've had an accounting system since the Egyptians, so 5,000 years. This is a two-year-old rule. Burden of proof is he, on he who asserts this is a good rule. It sounds good. It's called mark to mark. It sounds like it's a good thing to do. The dilemma is when the, when, when the regulators are doing the kind of things they were doing, arbitrarily letting somebody fail, arbitrarily saving somebody else, markets can't integrate that kind of information and the, and the market process starts working. And, and in that kind of market, the information is not really, it's, it's the fair value accounting is not consistent with the law of supply and demand. I'll give you a simple example. Maybe I, I think my house is worth $600,000. Uh, in the middle of this crisis, the only person that would buy it would be somebody that would pay $300,000. Well, I don't owe anything on my house. I don't have to sell it. I'm not going to sell it. However, if I were a business, I'd have to value that house at $300,000 and take a $300,000 write down immediately. Uh, give you another example. Major cause of systematic problems, unnecessary, an accounting system causing these problems. There's a, there's a mortgage bond in the marketplace that initially was $100 million, and it's backed up by home mortgages, of which some people aren't paying, and some people are projected not to pay. Do it using a very conservative economic analysis, that bond ought to be worth $80 million and the holder of the bond ought to take a $20 million loss, okay? In the middle of this crisis, the only people that would buy those bonds were people that wanted huge discounts, and the quote market price was $50 million, $50 million. What that meant is the holder of the bond, instead of taking a $20 million loss, had to take a $50 million loss. Go back to that multiple <coughs> bank capital. In the bank capital that should have been lost would be $20 million. That would reduce lending by $200 million. Under this scenario, because of fair value accounting, the loss was $50 million times 10 or $500 million. So a lot of the liquidity lost in the, in the financial system happened because of an accounting entry. Now, here's an interesting question, those of you that understand economics. Why didn't people like bb t that were buried with cash, why didn't we go in and buy these bonds? And if we all went in, we'd certainly drive the price closer to $80 million. Very simple reason. We looked, I personally made this decision, looked at these bonds, said this bond economics is worth $80 million. It's only a great deal at $50 million. Why wouldn't we buy it? We couldn't take the accounting risk because we didn't know at the end of the next quarter it wouldn't be priced at $40 million and the Federal Reserve might force us to go into the capital markets and raise more capital, which we practically, could, practically couldn't do in this in kind of environment. So the accounting system calls people not to make natural market decisions. Uh, <clears throat> One last thought about fair value accounting. People don't realize this. We do not have a private market accounting system in the United States. Our accounting rules are laws. They're made by the SEC. The vast majority of employees of the SEC are lawyers, uh, not, not accountants. Um, I, I've dealt with thousands of small businesses, big businesses in my career. I do not know a single business that actually runs its business based on what's called general accepted accounting principles. Everybody runs their businesses using their internal numbers, and we all convert them <laughs> to generally accepted accounting principles, which means that it's absolutely a useless, uh, useless accounting system. <laughs> um, one factor that wasn't subprime, but another factor that had a pretty big impact in this financial crisis is something called a pick-a-payment mortgage, and this is going to help you integrate some stuff here. Pick a payment mortgage or, or negative amortization mortgages where somebody comes in, they buy a house, the interest is $1,000 a month, but they only have to pay $500 a month. And they get to qualify based on the $500 a month amount, which allows them to buy a much bigger house, of course. And what happened with these mortgages is you paid less than the interest, so at the end of five years you owed more in your house uh, than you did when you bought it. Great mortgage, right? The theory, with these mortgages were very, pro, uh, very popular in Southern California, Southern Florida, Metro DC, where the theory was, particularly young people, and these were not sub these were people like you, <laughs> young people come in, buy as big a house as you possibly can, leverage it up the, the kazoo and it's going to appreciate at X percentage a year, and after five years you simply refinance a, mor a mortgage. Guess who dominated the uh, pick a pay with mortgage businesses? People like Golden West, Washington Mutual and Countrywide, who financed this pick a payment portfolio uh, using high interest rates on, on certificates of deposits. They could not have financed, the pick a payment mortgage couldn't have been financed without FDIC insurance. BB&T chose not to offer this product, and I'll, I'll come, draw a circle around this in, in a minute, not over economics. Over the, at the time, in fact, we got criticized for not doing this. At the time, we could make these loans, we could sell them to the secondary market and make a profit doing it. However, one of the fundamental commitments in our commitment, in, in our mission, is to help our clients achieve economic success and financial security. Something I say to all of our employees is absolutely never, ever do anything that you know will be bad to, to your clients uh, because it will come back to haunt you in the long term. 
And if you treat your clients right, if you do the right things for them, uh, you'll have a more successful relationship in the long term. We didn't see the crash in the housing markets, but we knew housing prices would not appreciate for 15% per year for perpetuity. It's simply not mathematically possible. We knew this would be bad, particularly for young people, and that five years later we'd, have, we'd helped a lot of people get in financial trouble. So we chose not to offer this product over ethics. Um, how did we get to where we are now? Today, 95% of home financing in the U.S. is done through either Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, or, or the FHA. The government owns the finance business for the housing market. How did that happen? It's not, it's not a natural process. Uh, it, it's interesting. It's, it happened because of a systematic destruction of the savings and loan industry by government policy. When I uh, got my first house in, in the early 1970s, I went down to a local savings and loan. I put 20% down, I got an 80% mortgage that was payable over 30 years, and 95% of people in America went down to a local savings and loan, that's how they financed their houses. They, they had been in that business for 70 years, they had had very low, low losses because they cared about the, the houses, they, they, you know, they, they held, held the mortgages, uh, and they knew their markets, so very low loss ratios. And then the savings and loan industry was systematically destroyed by government policy. And it's got some implications for today, because uh, you can look at the long-term consequences. And it started with Lyndon Bain Johnson back in the 1960s. Johnson wanted to have the Great Society, and he wanted to conduct the Vietnam War, but he didn't want to pay for it, because the taxing people was not popular. So the Federal Reserve printed a bunch of money to finance the Great Society uh, and the Vietnam War, which resulted in hyperinflation in the 1970s that spun out of control, and finally in the early 1980s, in order to keep us from totally collapsing, the Federal Reserve drove the prime rate to 23%. Savings and loans have been making these 8% home mortgages forever. Their certificate of deposit costs went to 14, 15%. Lots of savings and loans fail. The few that got through that cycle got some help from their regulator, the FSLIC. By the way, the FSLIC failed, cost the taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars. You know what happened to the employees of the FSLIC? They all went to work for the FDIC. That's a punishment for <laughs> if you're a government employee. That's where they ended up. Anyway, some of them are still there today. Uh, they gave them some interesting advice. They told them, this is a little esoteric, they made them hedge their home mortgage portfolios. You can't hedge a home mortgage because there's no prepayment penalty. When rates finally did start falling, everybody refinanced the home mortgages and the, the SNLs had billions and billions of dollars of losses on their hedges. And then they told them, well, you can't make money in the home mortgage business. What you need to do is get in the commercial real estate lending business, financing shopping centers and office buildings, uh, which they had no expertise in. That led to a bubble in the early 1990s, and then most of the savings and loans failed. In that gap is, uh, is where Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae took over the home mortgage finance business in the U.S. Now, it was an interesting experience because I was there when this was going on. We'd have loved to got, get into the home mortgage business. We, didn't, we hadn't made the interest rate risk uh, 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 mistakes, the savings and loan. We'd love to get in that business, but we could not compete against the federal government. A private company cannot compete with somebody when the government guarantees their debt. Remember, they were leveraged 1,000 to 1. They had the lowest cost of capital. So they drove everybody out of, initially out of the prime business. They took over the prime business before, before they took over the subprime business. I don't have any empathy in a way for Golden West, but you know why they got into the pick of payment mortgage business? They could not compete against Freddie and Fannie. So they did what they could do. I would argue if Freddie and Fannie had existed, we pick a payment mortgages never even would have been uh, created in the first place. Golden West went into the pick a payment mortgage business to compete, the only way they can compete against the federal government. Of course, now, if Congress puts pressure on Freddie and Fannie to get into the subprime mortgage business, which they actually didn't want to do, but they were forced into that business, the traditional prime lenders couldn't meet that model, so they went to people like Countrywide and Washington Mutual, and then they went to local brokers and they started feeding, feeding that market. And then the market moved from what's called originate and hold, originate and sell. Originate and hold means you make a mortgage, you hold it on your books, which means you care about the risk. Originate and sell means you make a mortgage, you sell it to some other person, and if you can sell it to them, you don't care about what the risk is. That led to lots of uh, perverse incentives, floppiness, and then finally lots of uh, fraud. Individual comes in and says, you know, I made uh, $60,000 last year. He really made fifty. The broker says, well, didn't you really make $70,000? Because if you made $70,000, I can get you a bigger mortgage and, and you know house prices are going up and you want to buy as big a house as pos possible. Um, that stuff got misrated by Standard Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch. This is when the investment bankers step in and securitize these products and sell them into the secondary markets. People say the investment bankers were greedy. They were absolutely greedy. 
fact, in my 40 years in business, Wall Street has always been at the maximum greed level. There's never been a day. <laughs> but they were no more greedy during this crisis than they were before in the good times. It, describing this, this problem that's created by greed on wars is ridiculous. There's always a maximum amount of greed on wars. Greed and fear, that's it. That's the way Wall Street's operated. There was no bubble of greed. That's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's impossible. Can't, it's not possible. Um, I think they were dumb. Um, here's what they did. Now, this this takes me a long time to describe these. I'm just going to real quick. You heard about things like CDOs and CIVs, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, uh, initially legitimate ideas. The way CDO got, got created was a bank makes a $500 million loan to General Electric. Even though General Electric is theoretically a low risk, they don't want to hold all that risk. They said, I'm going to hold $100 million. I'm going to sell $400 million in the capital markets to diversify the risk. They started looking at mortgages and said, well, how can we make, make more money in the mortgage business? And they created something they called tranches. They'd have a group of mortgages that, I'm trying to make it simple, would be rated B. They'd say, well, I got some people that want to buy some Bs, but I got some people that like to buy a little lower risk and would take a little lower return. And I got some people that like to buy a higher risk and take a higher return. So we're going to create tranches. And the way the tranches work is the C tranche takes the first loss, the next losses go into the B tranche, and then finally the last loss is into the A tranche, and the theoretically no losses get to the A tranche. A couple things go bad on them. First, the A, Bs, and Cs were not A, Bs, and Cs. They were D minuses, F, and F minuses. That was a bad mistake. And then secondly, they did a very interesting thing. They're selling the A, Bs, and Cs, making lots of money. Along comes Bernanke, inverts the yield curve. I'm over at Merrill Lynch. Suddenly, I had not got any assets I can hold that I can make any money in. So if I start looking at these Cs, and I really believe they're Cs, I don't believe they're Fs, I believe they're Cs, and I said, well, why don't I keep selling the A's and Bs, and now I'll portfolio the Cs because they got positive spreads in them. So Merrill Lynch is making a fortune a year before they go broke, right? And then they go broke suddenly because when the market starts coming down the seas, they lose 100 cents on the dollar, 100 cents on the dollar. Um, credit default swaps, and other, that sounds esoteric, just an insurance policy. I'm at Goldman Sachs. I got a mortgage portfolio that's B rated. If I, get it, <clears throat> if I can get it triple A rated, I, I don't have to keep any capital under the SEC rules. So I go over to, to AIG, the only AAA rated insurance company in the world, and buy an insurance policy, and my B's become AAA rated. AIG underwrites this policy, gets insurance premium, a couple mistakes. A, they, the A, B's, and C's were all off, but they were, you know, the, uh, the standard force moved. And then, then, then AIG's own mathematical models failed. They, they missed in these policies. What's an interesting question is why, why did we save AIG? Uh, I can tell you why, and then, I'll get, uh, uh, and then you can make your own judgment of the ultimate motivation. AIG is the largest insurance provider in the world. BB&T is the sixth largest insurance distributor in the world. We are AIG's largest customer in the U.S. I am absolutely certain that if AIG had parent company had failed, it would not have impacted their insurance operations. The real risk was in the parent company that was doing these esoteric uh, uh, policies. The, why save AIG then? It doesn't impact the insurance markets. The answer to that is that uh, AIG has some big counterparties. The number one biggest counterparty is Goldman Sachs. Well, if you happen to be Paulson and you're Secretary of the Treasury and you spent your whole career at Goldman Sachs and you own $500 million worth of Goldman Sachs stocks and everybody that works for you in the Treasury uh, <coughs> uh, came out of Goldman Sachs, it is easy for you to believe that if Goldman Sachs goes, the world goes. And you can believe that honestly. You can believe that, quote, honestly. You can believe it honestly. Um, so, you save AIG to save Goldman Sachs. And by the way, in the process, we saved we, uh, we, over $50 billion worth of counterparty risk with European banks that we, we bailed out in the process. You can also, one of the interesting questions, you can, why pay 100 cents on the dollars on these contracts? Usually when you're saving something, you at least, the other guy at least takes a haircut, right? Interesting question. So maybe it was systems risk. Uh, by the way, system risk is grossly exaggerated. Total misunderstanding of the derivatives market. Total misunderstanding how big it is. BB&T had we had uh, uh, the, uh, derivative contracts with Bear Stearns. We had derivative comments contracts with Lehman Brothers. We didn't lose one penny. If Goldman had gone, we'd have, maybe we lost a few million bucks. All the commercial banks hedged their derivative contracts, and we usually hedged them with cash. The counterparty risk was grossly exaggerated. Now Goldman Sachs would have gone. They were the speculators. But so what? I mean, who would have cared? It would have been so what. <laughs> um, real, real myth. The banks were deregulated before this happened. That is absolutely not. In fact, the regulatory environment during the peak of this bubble was the worst in my career until right now. Until right now. Um, it was just misdirected. It was focused on the Sarbanes-Oxley and the Patriot Act. Now, Sarbanes-Oxley is supposed to end in fraud in the accounting systems that came out of the world common in Ron. The banks had a Sarbanes-Oxley back in 1990 because of the thrift crisis. This was a redundant system, a redundant system. 
The Patriot Act is where we're supposed to catch tariffs. We spend $5 billion a year on the Patriot Act. You know how many tariffs we've caught? None. You know how many tariffs we're likely to catch? None. How will the odds of one of our tellers catching a tariff sign? And if we caught one, do you think we'd call them anyway and say, well, we got a terrorist? <laughs> I think so. We, they did catch Elliot Spitzer for uh, uh, <laughs> prostitution. <laughs> now, in a way, that's poetic justice, but on the other hand, it should scare you. You think about it, the Patriot Act used to put a governor in jail over prostitution. That's scary. That, this, is, this is Big Brother, right out of... Big brother. <laughs> uh, one of the big problems of rational belief in mathematical modeling comes out of academia. Mathematical models can be useful, but they have some fundamental problems. All the mathematical models fail. The Fed did not predict this recession, did not predict any recession. Uh, AIG's models fail, the uh, uh, Standard Poor's Moody's models fail. Uh, we, we were under intense regulatory pressure to have mathematical models like Wachovia and Citigroup that failed, uh, that were best practices. We did those models, we just didn't pay any attention to them. Uh, Basel, um, probably may not remember this, but when the crisis first hit, there was about a month where people in Europe were kind of laughing at the U.S., and then all of a sudden all the European banks failed. Boom. Uh, and the reason for that is they had implemented Basel in Europe. We hadn't implemented it in the U.S. Basel was an agreement where banks determined their capital using mathematical formulas. Well, based on those, those agreements, the European banks had no capital, and when they started going down, they liquidated very, very fast. This was a huge misdirection of management strategy. If they threaten to put you in jail, which they did under these laws, it impacts your behavior pretty dramatically. Um, another interesting thing, this crisis, and even to this day, has been dramatically accelerated and deepened by the action of the bank regulators. Bank regulators at the top say they want banks to make loans. That's the big lie. If you're a local bank examiner, the way you get in trouble is your bank gets in trouble. And you're a career bureaucrat, and you don't care what the people at the top of their political employees think. So what the bank examiners have been doing is tightening their lending standards. Today, bb and is not making loans we wouldn't make. We're putting people out of business we wouldn't put out of business because of the bank examiners. And it's happened every time in my career. One thing, the public policy is absolutely true. I've dealt with regulators indirectly and directly several, probably thousand times throughout my career. And I will say this with certainty, anytime there's a, a conflict between the regulatory good and what we would call the public good, they always pick the regulatory good, 100% of the time. That's how they act. <coughs> SEC, we talked a little bit about that. Just one thing I wanted to focus on, loan loss reserves. For years, banks set loan loss reserves using both historical experience and then judgment. The SEC came in and forced a change in the reserving requirements and forced you to use mathematical models. And the way these models worked is you used history and then you used economic projections. When, before this crisis started, we'd had, a long, we hadn't had an economic correction of any magnitude since the early 1990s. We had a great history of loan losses and we had all these forward forecasts, including the Fed, that said the economy is going to be great. So banks had much lower loan loss reserves than they would have had if they could have used their own judgment. Because there's an old saying in the banking business, you make your, your bad loans in the good times, and you do. And, and banks would have kept higher reserves, but the SEC literally wouldn't let us kick our reserves. Now, why that matters is a lot of loss in capital was banks simply raising reserves back to levels they would have had anyway. So that a lot of this destruction of liquidity was a recreation of reserves that would have already existed if the SEC hadn't changed the rules of the game. Market corrections are not bad. The world's a better place to live. Thank goodness Washington Mutual and Countrywide are out of business. Those are good things. Credit standards were way too loose. We had excessive leverage. We needed higher savings. We had an overinvestment in housing that needed to be corrected. We needed a correction. What we didn't need is the magnitude of the errors, which we wouldn't have had in a, in a marketplace because we'd already been corrected. And then we didn't need how the correction was actually handled. Um, I went through a similar, potentially worse crisis in the early 1980s. Fed raises the interest rates, prime rate to over 20%. We, one out of three banks in the U.S. failed, two out of three savings and loans in the U.S. fails. But we didn't have a crisis. In fact, we were already, by this time, we were already back. The economy was turned around. We were headed, headed in a great direction. We, the way this was handled, the inconsistency, suddenly they, you know, they saved Citigroup, uh, they let Wachovia fail, they saved Goldman, they let Lehman fail. Markets can't deal with the arbitrary nature of these. And then they, they ask for $700 billion out of the blue and say the sky's going to fall. A lot of the problems, the, the spiral down was not necessary. We, we needed a correction, but not the magnitude of what we needed. Um, heard a lot about TARP. TARP is a capital investment that was made into banks. Um, people asked me if TARP was necessary. Well, the answer to that is yes and no. By the time they got to TARP, probably <laughs> they needed to do it, but they, there was 100 things they could have done so we would have never needed to get to TARP. 
One just little aside, one of the main purposes of TARP, by the way, was to save General Electric. People don't realize that. General Electric's half their business in the finance area. They do high-risk finance for things like airplanes. They, they finance it in the commercial paper market. Commercial paper market was locked. The Fed stepped in and saved General Electric. That's why you see General Electric kissing up to the government. That's it. They got saved. Um, all banks, large banks, I use the word chose to participate in TARP. That's an interesting personal story for me. I was adamantly opposed to TARP. I wrote congressman, and I was the only CEO of a large bank that was out, out there publicly opposed to TARP. And then when TARP was passed, we, we took the TARP money. And, I, and this is how uh, the government works. I had a very interesting experience on that. Not too surprising, but interesting. Day after TARP passed, I get a call from our regulator, the FDIC, and they say, you know, John, just want to let you know, uh, under the old capital ratios we used to have, which we've had for 20 years, in the banking business, you guys have a lot more capital than you need. But we've decided now we're going to have some new capital ratios. Uh, we don't know what these new ca capital ratios are, but we're confident that you won't pass these new capital ratios unless you take TARP. And we have an audit team coming in tomorrow to audit you <laughs> to show that you don't have enough capital. We said, please send us TARP. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Why did they do that? Bernanke, he's an academic. He's a student of the Depression. Terrible, he has a terrible, mo his terrible paper that made him famous. Awful. You ought to read it sometime if you, it's wrong. Anyway, he, he's a student of the Depression. He thinks it's 1930. Whatever it was, it weren't 1930. Anyway, in the 1930s, the government tried to save individual institutions. Didn't work. The market jumped on them. Three large financial institutions getting ready to fail. Bernanke doesn't want to save the, the individual institutions because he's worried that the market will jump on those companies. So he says, look, if I can force all the $100 billion banks to participate in, in this program and say it's to make more loans, then it's going to obscure what's going on. So he basically forces all the large banks to participate in TARP. TARP's a rip-off for healthy banks. We pay a very high interest rate. We didn't need the money. Remember, they came back in the next spring and did, did a stress test, and we had way more capital than we need, which we knew. So it's a redistribution from the healthy to the unhealthy banks. Um, the long-term consequences are huge. We created an oligopoly in the banking business with five banks that are too large to fail, and, and, and the new law, the, uh, the Frank Dodd bill, does not deal with that, and so that is a huge, a huge risk issue for us. Um, healthy financial institutions were hurt by TARP. It was simply a redistribution. Short term, we need to let markets correct. Uh, that's what the market correction process is about. Interesting thing, uh, General Motors Acceptance Corporation, they've been saved three times now by the government. They finance automobiles. Uh, uh, the, th the theory is that they, uh, they're essentially the automobile finance business. They actually contributed to a lot of the problems in the automobile finance business. And the way they did that is they created the seven-year 100% car loan. Well, uh, the problem with that is after three years, people owe more on their car than it's worth. And, and, a lot, and a lot of people couldn't buy cars. They're now back doing seven-year, 100% car loans, thank you to the, for the federal government. Um, Citigroup, in my career, Citigroup has failed three times. Every time they've been rescued, and every time they've gotten bigger and worse, bigger and worse. I'll make you a prediction. In 15 years, Citigroup will fail again. I, I would say that with almost certainty. Interesting examples, Chrysler. 1980s, Chrysler fails. The government bails them out. Good thing, right? I'll make you a simple argument. If Chrysler had been allowed to fail in the 1980s, we'd have a better automobile industry today. Am I having? Can you stand by the podium because we're having, we suddenly had a mic problem. A sudden, all right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hear me now? All right. No better is better. <laughs> is better. All right. Chrysler. Chrysler in the 1980s was saved by the federal government. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I would argue that the automobile industry is much worse today because Chrysler was saved in the 1980s. Why is that? If Chrysler had failed, the resources that Chrysler had would have gone to General Motors and Ford, which would have made them better companies. In addition, there may have been a private company created with non-unions. So the, the Japanese genius was not having unions. There's nothing else about the There may have been a U.S. automobile uh, company that ha didn't have unions. But equally important, what was the lessons that the management and the unions learn when Chrysler was saved. There is no downside risk. The government's going to save us. The government's going to save us. We would have a better in automobile industry in the U.S. if Chrysler had been allowed to save. Uh, cut government spending. This is an interesting belief. This, common sensely. Do you believe that you can create a better world by spending money you don't have on things that don't need to be done? <laughs> Pretty bizarre belief, right? 
That was sponsored by a guy named James Johns Maynard Keynes, who wrote a book called The General Theory. It's a pretty bizarre book. You ought to read it sometime. In the, in the, in the book, he argues that, uh, <laughs> I find this interesting, he argues that under adverse times, you should pay people to dig holes in the ground and then pay people to fill, fill them back up. Now, do you really think that's going to raise your standard of living? That's a pretty bizarre belief. Uh, which if you, if you want to incent anything, cut taxes and give money to the people that know how to create jobs, real jobs, <laughs> and that know how to improve productivity. <laughs> and also, I, I teach leadership at Wake Forest. The worst thing you can do in a human system under stress is introduce ambiguity. Our leadership has failed. I don't care how good you feel about the health care program or how good you feel about the financial bill, introducing 3,000-page bills in an uncertain environment is terrible for businesses because under adversity, people assume the worst. And the more ambiguity, the more, the more, and so lots of small businesses don't create jobs because they don't know what this health care bill means. They don't know how to, what, what the financial bill means for, their, means for their banks. You don't introduce ambiguity in a system headed in the wrong direction. Price instability is a big issue. This is a big problem today. What we know is the Fed's printing out money like crazy. We've got Quote, def we don't have deflation, we have modest inflation now. Now, we know the consequences might be severe inflation in the long term. It makes it very hard for people to make. They tend to make what's called barbell investments. They put money in cash and they do high-risk kind of things. The most fundamental issue is the attack on free markets. Uh, markets didn't fail. Government policy failed. The attack on wealthies are very destructive. No, not all wealthy people are productive, but most of the really productive people are wealthy. Uh, when you attack the productive, what do they do? They become more cautious. Uh, Roosevelt did this during the 30s. Great politics gets you elected very destructive economically. They, they don't make, wealthy people don't make investments when they're under attack. Um, long term, we need to privatize Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. We need to let banks make mortgages like the old s &Ls did. Um, one of the few uh, financial systems in the world that had, uh, didn't have problems was in Canada. And one of the main reasons is the Canadian banks finance home mortgages. And because of that, they didn't have a bubble in the residential real estate market because they hold the risk. Um, if I were in charge, and I will never be in charge, I would go to a market-based economic system. I think the Fed has made a series of horrible mistakes and will continue to do so uh, with, a, with a standard selected by the market, which would probably be gold. I will say this. As long as the Federal Reserve exists, you're depending on politicians to have self-discipline, and they will never have self-discipline. If, if you don't do that, then you should strip the Federal Reserve of its powers, do what Friedman said, and have them force them to grow the money supply to, at a fixed rate. Something practically they could do is reprivatize the system in this sense, uh, force banks to have enough capital so the risk is really with shareholders, not with the public. But you've got to eliminate or reduce the FDIC insurance, make it sure the Fed can't save General Electric, and you've got to eliminate about 90% of the regulations. What they've done, they're trying to force banks to raise more capital, and they've added more regulations. Well, the regulatory cost kills the energy. Regulatory cost of the banking industry is far bigger than income taxes. If you ask me which one I'd rather get rid of in the banking business, I'd get rid of regulations, not income taxes for our, for our industry. Um, we need no neutral tax rates, materially reduce government spending, reduce government regulations. We need free trade. We need to privatize Freddie and Fannie, but we also need to privatize Medicare and Social Security because we've got whopping deficits. We've got to encourage immigration. This is an interesting I issue. Uh, you know, people talk about the Japanese economy. The Japanese, have, you can argue where they've made mistakes in monetary physical policy, but their fundamental problem is that they have no growth in people. And, and, and that is a big economic problem for them. We need to restore discipline, save more, and spend less. I want to leave the economics, though, and talk about something far, far more important. Because this is not really an economic crisis. This is really a philosophical crisis. And the real issues are philosophical, not economic. The real cause of the financial crisis is a combination of altruism and pragmatism. Where did affordable housing come from? Everybody has a right to a house provided by who? Everybody has a right to free medical care provided by who? And my right to free medical care is my right to enslave a doctor to provide me with that care or to enslave somebody else to, 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 to pay for that doctor. That is fundamentally opposite of the American concept of rights. In the American concepts of rights, each one of us has the moral right to what we produce and what we create. But we don't have the right to what somebody else produces, what somebody else creates. Altruism leads to a redistribution from the productive to the non-productive. And even at a deeper level, it says that nobody has a right to their own life. In business, altruism gets combined with pragmatism. 
because you can't really be an altruist and stay in business in a, in a market economy. So businesses people become their backup is pragmatism. And what pragmatism says is just do what works. Unfortunately, many things work in the short term that are incredibly destructive in the long term. Negative amortization mortgages worked for over 10 years and were incredibly destructive in the long term. Interesting thing about pragmatists is they can't be rational because rationality determines, it requires a long-term perspective. Pragmatists cannot uh, have integrity because integrity requires that you act consistent with principles. It's not surprising there's so much lack of integrity in the business community because they're doing what works, right? Combine pragmatism and altruism and you get something I call the free lunch mentality. Uh, last um, presidential election, neither one of the candidates proposed any serious solution to Social Security and Medicare, and if they had, they wouldn't have been elected. And that free lunch men mentality leads to a lack of personal responsibility, and that is the death of democracies. The Founding Fathers talked about the tyranny of the majority, and they were primarily talking about the abuse of individual rights, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. But they also realized that when 51% of the people figured out they could vote a free lunch from 49%, Pretty soon it was over, because then 60% want a free lunch from 40%, and then 70% want a free lunch from 30%, and then the 30% quit. The cure is also philosophical, and the cure is embedded in the philosophical principles that underlie the United States. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each individual's moral right to their own life including each individual's moral right to the product of their labor, including if they produce a lot, they get a lot, including the right to give it to whoever they want to give it to. That moral edict demands personal responsibility because there is no free lunch. It also demands and rewards rationality and self-discipline. When people hear life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, most people think about liberty, and liberty is very important. It's a very important idea, but it's an old idea. It goes back to the Greeks. The world-changing idea expressed by Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence was the pursuit of happiness. Before Jefferson, before the thinkers of the Enlightenment, everybody existed for somebody else's good. Good of the king, good of the state, good of the church. Nobody existed for their own good. Jefferson said that each one of us has the moral right to the pursuit of our personal happiness. We're not guaranteed success in that pursuit, but we have that right. That is the idea that changed the world. That is the idea that created the most successful society in history and also the most benevolent society. When people have the right to their own life, they're naturally nicer to other people. In socialist and communist societies, everybody ends up hating each other because they're all slaves to each other. And I agree with Jefferson. I agree that each one of us has a moral right to pursuit of our personal happiness. In fact, the United States was the first company, country ever created on the idea that we should act in our rational self-interest properly understood. What do I mean by properly understood? Sometimes when people talk about acting selfishly, they, they say it's really about taking advantage of other people. Here's the irony. Taking advantage of other people is not selfish, it's self-destructive. Uh, you know, you see this in business on, on a practical level. You might fool Tom, you might fool Dick, but soon, pretty soon they're going to tell Harry and Jane and nobody's going to trust you. And you probably know people like that. Taking advantage of people doesn't work practically. In addition, if you try to take advantage of other people, uh, you're going to do a lot of psychological damage to yourself. Trying to manipulate other people's minds, <laughs> letting go of reality is going to do a lot of psychological damage to you. So taking advantage of other people is not selfish. The, the moral uh, directive most of us are given in our society is that we ought to self-sacrifice. I want to ask you a very important question. I would argue it's the most important question you, you need to ask ever. It's a very fundamental question. Do you have as much right to your life as anybody else? Do you have as much right to your life as anybody else? Of course you do. Of course you do. Why would you believe anything different than that? Why would you believe anything different than that? So you shouldn't take advantage of other people and you shouldn't self-sacrifice, but there is a proper moral ethic and it's a proper moral ethic for a free society. It's the ethic that should underlie our legal system and our, and our economic system. And that is that we are fundamentally traitors. We trade value for value. We get better together. In our business, we help our clients achieve economic success and financial security. They let us make a profit doing it. Life is about getting better together. In fact, there are only two stable relationship conditions, win-win and lose-lose. Whenever you get greedy and you set up a win-lose, you see this in spousal relationships, pretty soon your partner's going to get bitter and you're going to end up in a lose-lose. Whenever you get self-sacrificial and you set up a lose-win, you're going to get bitter and you end up in a lose-lose relationship. So any important relationship in your life, you should ask, what's in it for me? That is a fair question. But you should also ask, what's in it for them? Because if there's nothing in it for them, in the long term, there'll be nothing in it for you. 
So life is about creating win-win relationships, and that is a moral ethic that underlies a free society, and that's really what life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness really is about. My favorite book by far was Atlas Shrugged, written by Ayn Rand in 1957. That's my favorite book. I'm glad there's other people that's their favorite book. The interesting thing, Rand wrote this book so her predictions won't, weren't going to come true. Unfortunately, they are coming true. <laughs> if you haven't read Atlas Shrugged, if you haven't read it re recently, you ought to read it. It's very relevant to what's happening today. Where do we go from here? We've experienced a long, serious correction. I do think we're in a recovery. I think it's unlikely possible that we'll have a double dip. Uh, looking forward, I, if I ask the next five, ten years, what I see is stagflation. A lot, it looks very much like the 1970s. And what stagflation looks like, there's some real growth, there's higher levels of inflation, and there's higher unemployment than necessary, maybe lower than now, but we get stuck at a very high unemployment rate. Uh, it's not terrible times, but it's not a good time. Here's what you really ought to be worried about, however. What happens in 20, 25 years? It does depend on us, but we have the recipe for an economic disaster. We have huge actorial liabilities in Social Security and Medicare, in Obamacare, in unfunded public pension plans. The estimates are between 50 and $100 trillion. They're huge numbers. We're running trillion-dollar-plus annual operating deficits. Uh, we have a dysfunctional uh, foreign policy. Uh, we, have, we have a big demographic problem with the retirement of the baby doomers, and we have a failed K-12 through education system. We have a recipe for disaster. Um, I told you that story about being on the uh, Financial Services Roundtable Committee looking at Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and it was mathematically certain that they were going broke. Uh, it, the same thing is true for the United States. If you run the numbers in 20, 25 years, the United States mathematically goes, in fact, Medicare alone assume, uh, consumes our total gross national product uh, going forward. Um, the way countries go broke, we don't file bankruptcy like uh, businesses do. Countries usually hyperinflate, they print a lot of money, and usually become a third world economy. 1940, Argentina had a better economic system, a higher standard of living than the United States, and they went uh, the wrong direction. Now, I am not in the hopeless group. Th these problems are fixable. They're not fixable painlessly, right? <laughs> we, we want them to go away without any pain. Here's, here's the analogy. We have a kind of cancer that's terminal if we don't treat it. Treating it's no fun, but failing to treat it is terminal. And, and what we want it to go away without treating it. But we're going to have this. There's no painless solution, but it is solvable. The longer we wait, the harder it is. And at some point, 10 years from now, it's not, not solvable. The answer philosophically is, is both simple and profound. It's to return to the principles that made America great, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, individual rights, and free markets. Um, there is some good news, and I think we saw that in the last election. I call it the American sense of life. It's a little confused, it's a little befuddled, but at some level, many people in the United States know that big government is not necessarily good, and they're skeptical of big government solutions, and that, that's a positive. I have a challenge for you, though. Uh, you may not think of yourselves in this context, but you are leaders. You are going to be leaders in, in, in your whole careers. You're, you wouldn't be here if you weren't in leadership positions. And while we've had failures in economics, we've had fa failures in, in philosophy, we've also had failures of leadership. Failures of leadership in government, failures of leadership in business, uh, and we need principal leaders. And I, and I want to share with you a thought. Um, bb and was fortunate in a certain sense. We came through the financial crisis better than almost any large bank. We, had no, we didn't have a single lost quarter. People asked me was that we had better strategies or better people. We had, no, <laughs> we had good strategy, we had good people. Uh, but we have a better philosophy, and we lived with our philosophy. We believed it. We believed it. Underlying that philosophy uh, are ten core values, and underlying those ten core values are what I think are the three great virtues, the three great virtues, purpose, reason, and self-esteem. Purpose, reason, and self-esteem. As human beings, we're purpose-directed entities. You have to know where you're going in order to get there. Organizations, businesses, churches, civic organizations, universities are simply groups of human beings. For organizations to be successful, the people in those organizations must vest in the purpose of the organization. And as an individual, you need a sense of purpose. Something I find very discouraging. How many people I talk to, and I ask them about their work, and they describe their work as some kind of burden. Oh, i got to go to work. And that's a shame. Because you think about all the time, effort, and energy you spend at work. If work is just a burden, wow, are you missing what life is about. And by the way, this is it. This is not practice. This is your life. If you're going to have passion and energy in your life, you've got to have passion and energy in your work. And to do that, you have to have a sense of purpose in your work. The content of purpose will vary a lot in this room, but I would argue the context is the same for every single purpose here. 
and has two components, each of which are equally important. The first component is I believe every person in this room wants to make the world a better place to live. I don't believe you'd be here today if you didn't want to make the world a better place to live. I actually think that's a characteristic of the vast majority of human beings, not everybody. But I believe every person in this room wants to make the world a better place to live. Now, the interesting thing is you don't have to go to Africa and feed hungry children to make the world a better place to live. There are lots of ways to make the world a better place to live. Businesses make the world a better place to live. We produce better products, better services, and improve the quality of life. In fact, the primary difference between the quality of life in Africa and the quality of life in the United States, we have better businesses. Uh, business is noble work. When business leaders forget they're in business to make the world a better place to live, bad things happen to those businesses. Good lawyers, good, good doctors, good, good homemakers make the world a better place to live. There are lots of ways to make the world a better place to live. But you need to believe that your work is making the world a better place to live. The second component of purpose, however, is equally important and way under-discussed. You need to make the world a better place to live doing something you want to do for you. You have a fundamental moral right to your own life. And if you were to make the world a better place to live and you didn't enjoy doing it, you will have wasted the most precious thing you have, which is you. Which is you. Uh, in addition, if you try to make the world a better place to live doing something you don't want to do, the odds are you won't do it very well. So you need to make the world a better place to live doing something you want to do for you. The means by which you accomplish your purpose is your capacity to think. Uh, we use the term reason. Everything that's alive has a method of staying alive. A lion has claws to hunt with, a deer has speed to avoid the hunter. We have the capacity to think. And they're literally our only means of survival success. Uh, no, no shortcuts, no free lunches. Um, when I talk about the, the capacity to think, uh, at the individual level, one thing I say to the employees of BMT, this is not about having a high IQ. In fact, a lot of people with high IQs don't think so well. Uh, but it is about having a, a certain kind of mental discipline. And here's my challenge to you. Commit yourself to be a lifelong learner. And in that context, commit yourself to have a very active mind. And if you look at people that are lifelong learners, they tend to read more, they take more advantage of educational uh, experiences, but they're particularly effective at learning from their experiences. And as human beings, we are primarily experiential learners. And if you look at people that are superior experiential learners who ultimately become masters of the field of endeavor, they do two simple but profound things well. First, probably everybody in here can associate with learning from your mistakes. You probably have mistakes that have changed your life. But unfortunately, a lot of times we don't learn from our mistakes, do we? We get to do them over and over again. You probably embedded some mistakes in your personality, and we do them over and over again. Why do we not always learn from our mistakes? Because in order to learn from a mistake, we not only have to admit we made a mistake, but we have to admit the deepest psychological cause. And sometimes we're guilty of the ultimate psychological sin, which is the act of evasion. Evasion occurs when you're presented with some piece of information that at some level you know needs to be examined. But you refuse to examine it because it threatens something you want to believe about yourself or you want to believe about the world, so you literally don't hear it. And when you're evade, you're detached from reality and bad things happen. I started out in my career lending money to small businesses, to farmers. The number one reason small businesses fail, the leader of that business evades. Things are going along fine in the economy, something happens at home, something happens in the economy. He doesn't want to hear about it and runs the business right in the ground. Citigroup, largest financial institution in the world, hires a group of geniuses to run their affordable housing subprime lending businesses. Long before we heard about affordable housing, I guarantee the geniuses in the back room of Citigroup knew something was going wrong at some level. But what did they do? They evaded. They evaded because they were going to get a lot less money, and the company was going to get a lot less money, and they ran Citigroup right into the, the ground. Big mistakes are usually acts of evasion. The second thing that superior experiential learners do is recognize that life is a constant education if you choose to make it one. In, in bb &T, we had a series of community banks, and I would go have lunches with our local advisory board members who were business and community leaders, and I never had a boring lunch. They were always asking me questions. They always were talking about interesting issues. You could understand why they had been successful. They were in focus. Unfortunately, a lot of people live lots of their life out of focus. When you're out of focus, you can't learn, you can't grow. Superior experiential learners stay uh, in focus more. They evade less, and that gives them a huge competitive advantage in life. Interesting thing, when you're clear about your purpose and you use your thinking capacity to accomplish your purpose, you get to do something very important. You get to raise your self-esteem. Interesting observation for this group, and I'm, I'm sure this is true for this group, I observe this. In higher levels of organizations, for really bright people like we have in this room, if you fail, it won't be because you aren't well-educated enough and it won't be because you're not smart enough. If you fail, it'll be because of some low self-esteem issue that causes you to act in a self-destructive manner. And unfortunately, you see that sometimes in very bright, very well-educated people. In addition, self-esteem is the foundation for happiness, right? 
And happiness is the end of the game. And I don't mean having a good time on Friday night, but I mean a life well lived in the Aristotelian sense of that word, the hard earned, hard work, the tough kind of life uh, of, of happiness. It comes from a life well lived, that kind of happiness. Happiness is the end of the game. Sometimes in business, people get confused. They think money's the end of the game. Nothing wrong with money. Money's a really good thing. But money's not an end. It could be a means to an end, but it's not an end. Happiness is the end. And happiness has to be earned. Happiness is, begins with a high level of self-esteem, and self-esteem has to be earned. In fact, I want to share with you two thoughts about self-esteem, which is actually a very complex subject. First thought is self-esteem is fundamentally self-confidence and your ability to live and be successful given the facts of reality. So you earn self-esteem by how you live your life. No one can give you self-esteem. You cannot give anybody self-esteem. You cannot give your children self-esteem. Self-esteem is earned. Live your life with integrity. Raise your self-esteem. Second thought about self-esteem, for everybody in this room, the single biggest driver of your self-esteem will be your work. And I use work in the broadest context, raising children, very productive, very hard work. The reason that work is so important is you spend a disproportionate amount of time, effort, and energy at work. So work is the single biggest driver of your self-esteem. Something I say to all the employees of bb &T, it's real important to bb &T that you do your job well. It's far, far, far more important to you. Might fool me about how well you do your job, might fool your boss about how well you do your job, but you will never fool you. If you don't do your work the best you can possibly do it, give me your level of skill, give me your level of knowledge, you can't do the impossible, but if you don't do your work the best you can possibly do it, you will lower your self-esteem. Now here's the good news. Do your work the best you can possibly do it. Give me your level of skill, give me your level of knowledge, and you will raise your self-esteem. And that's more important than whether you get a promotion or you get, uh, you get more money because it's about who you are. By the way, as law students, the same is true, your, your work is your law work. And if you don't do your, your, your school as best you can possibly do it, you will lower your self-esteem, even if you get good grades. And if you do it as best you can possibly do it, you will raise your self-esteem, which is more important than you, when you get good grades. It's an interesting social issue that, that tra draws all this stuff together and why the American sense of life is so important. Take an entry-level construction worker, a bricklayer, Tough life, tough life. Um, works hard, raises his family. Reminds me of my, my granddad. Hard work, tough life. Uh, gets by, raises his children. Maybe his granddaughter becomes CEO of a publicly traded company. Maybe not, maybe not. He has a hard life, but he gets something very important from that work. He gets pride. He gets pride in himself. He gets self-esteem from that work. Take that same bricklayer and give him welfare. He may be better off economically, but he is far worse off spiritually. He loses pride. He loses his self-esteem, which is a very high price to pay. You know, we're talking a lot. A lot of what we do in our public policy has to do with security. And security is very important. We care about security. But the United States is not the land of security. People didn't get on a boat and come to Jamestown to be secure. The United States is the, it's the land of opportunity. Opportunity to be great, opportunity to fail and try again, but most importantly, the opportunity of that bricklayer to live his life on his own terms, to pursue his personal happiness in his own context. And that is the American sense of life, and that is what's so very important to protect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really, uh, I really appreciate that. <clears throat> I think we have time for some questions now. A few questions. Yes, sir. I'm Mike Kelly from uh, University of Florida, and I just want to say uh, you're my new hero. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, I was in the mortgage industry for five years. Okay. Uh,
infrastructure and how you can get into uh, you know, highly regulated uh, industries and really get in and make a difference. And my question to you is very open-ended and uh, I don't really have a lot of substance to the question, but how can we, uh, following on your admonition at the conclusion, uh, a lot of the students here, a lot of the participants here, we're going to be legislators, we're going to fill public office. How can we uh, in, invade areas like an entrepreneur and actually take, you know, the, the, the high level, make a difference, have self-esteem, but actually, actually really implement that difference? Well, I think two things. At the legislative level, the biggest thing you do is get rid of regulations <laughs> and just in mass. As an individual attorney, I'll offer you a challenge. Um, you never want to violate the law because it's laws of laws, but, you, but at the same time, you want to mostly be disciplined by ethics, clear set of ethical principles. Attorneys that within the law can do what's ethical and come up with better business solutions uh, often are very valuable to businesses. And I would have attorneys that figured out how not to do stuff, and we would have attorneys that would figure out how to do it. Not always within our ethics, but within, you know, technically legal, but the, the law is a very uh, gray area. So helping businesses figure ways around regulations that are ethical and technically legal, I think is a very valuable. And I think, uh, f fact, a fact, I think the truth is our economy couldn't work. If, if BB&T were to adhere to every single regulation, we'd, we'd have to close down because they're in conflict with each other. The Patriot Act and the Privacy Act are conflicting. So we have to have the attorneys to figure out how we can, how we can actually maneuver within the law. That was, that's a very valuable practical contribution. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a, a pretty complex So Here, Here's what I think. There's a very important rule for law. I mean, countries that don't have rule of law don't work, okay? <laughs> but the purpose of the law is to protect individual rights, not to redistribute wealth. It's, it's the purpose of the law, and, the per and that's kind of how our founding fathers started out. And that means we've got to have a military to protect us from foreign forces. We've got to have police to protect us from each other. We need a really functional court system in which attorneys are a very valuable part of that system. There can be very legitimate disputes among businesses about what we contractually agreed to, and there needs to be there needs to be laws around that. The regulatory environment needs to only be about protecting individual rights. Ninety-five percent of regulations aren't. They're they're mandating behaviors that, in many cases, are actually counterproductive. Usually designed actually to protect some inefficient competitor in the marketplace. So you could almost dump the total regulatory structure. I think. Um, uh, Frank Dodd is a, a movement in the wrong direction. The real killer in Frank Dodd that people don't talk much about is so-called consumer compliance. It's not consumer compliance. It's, it's credit allocation. It's giving the federal government, government, if you want to control a capitalist economy, control the allocation of credit. In fact, how we got here was the allocation of credit forced on the banking system and, and really forced on Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae in their defense by Congress through affordable housing. So, so Frank Dodd is really scary because they can control credit allocation in the U.S. Right now, they're tightening the standards. Long term, they're going to loosen the standards because it's politically, and, and, and we're going to set up an, another bubble. Um, my solution would be to get rid of all the Frank Dodds and go to a private banking system and, and let people operate with contracts and a court system that would enforce the contracts versus the government forcing a lots of agreements that nobody would, would agree to. And I would, go to, I would go to get rid of the Federal Reserve. I think that would be the beginning step for that. Um, 
I, I said this earlier, but it's naive to believe that regulators act in what's called the public good. First, I'm not sure what the public good is, but whatever it is, it, regulators always act in the regulatory good. It, 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 it's just some belief is common in our society. Just because you become, go work for the government, sudden, suddenly you don't have the same kind of incentive system. You just have a different set of incentive systems. And it, it's just naive to believe that they aren't, don't have perverse incentives in that regard. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I have two challenges to your um, conclusions about the uh, financial crisis. Okay. That I think that um, that might change how we want to uh, address certain issues if we decide one way or another is true. Okay. Uh, first is a small point. I think the mar market uh, accounting <clears throat> is a little unfair to uh, attack that. It's kind of like attacking the doctor who says you have cancer. It, it's like the, the diagnosis. Banks have very toxic assets, and if we don't require them to report you know, what the market's valuing at, it seems like uh, it'd be a lot easier to defraud uh, potential investors who want to know exactly how healthy banks are. Um, and the second point uh, is that possibly it wasn't exactly the Fed's fault um, for the lower interest rates. You have a, a huge savings glut from China uh, that was very sensitive to interest rates. And that even if the Fed wanted to change the savings rate, it probably wouldn't be able to uh, from, from all the money coming from China. Um, in both cases, I think you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> fair value accounting, I, I don't argue with marking assets down based on an economic analysis. When a market's panicky, which is exactly what we have because of arbitrary actions by the regulators, then the market, there's not a law of supply and demand is not working. They're time, and that's because of regulatory influence in the marketplace. And so you are actually forcing institutions to write down assets that they're now, by the way, making huge gains on, <laughs> uh, which, which was a mistake and created, accelerated the problem. Uh, in terms of the Chinese savings rate, the Federal Reserve, I was in the meetings, they, in, you know, they intentionally drove rates down. I mean, that, uh, Greenspan made a conscious decision to drive rates lower than the market would have taken. I mean, he said that. So, I mean, that's no, uh, uh, that, so that, that was a conscious policy decision. And Bernanke consciously just chose to, to raise rates so fast and created an inverted yield curve. Markets never invert yield curves. That creates a huge disincentive for risk, risk management in financial institutions. I, I don't think the Federal Reserve would deny it couldn't control short-term rates or, or deny that it made the choices. It, would, it might argue those were good choices. I'm sure it would argue they were good choices. I would argue they're bad choices, but it wouldn't deny it couldn't do it because of the savings rate in China. Um, in fact, what we did was create a terrible message to the Chinese. What should have been happening, prices in the U.S. should have been falling. Which is not, if you can buy stuff cheaper, that's not bad, right? In the 1890s, prices fell and the standard of living was rising like crazy. It's a good thing. Uh, but, but, but by holding prices up, what we did was tell the Chinese make more, manufacture more, uh, and, and we drove a lot of manufacturing jobs to China where if prices had been falling, the Chinese couldn't have made money even, or even it, it, eaten the losses in the falling prices. So the, bringing down interest rate, the purpose was to keep prices up, and, and, and it actually created a bad signal a bad signal in the marketplace. So that's, yes, sir. Yes, sir. How, we got to run out of time or? We're close on time, but also even more directly into the mic. We're oh. having problems with it. So. All right. Maybe I'll just pick this up. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, Oren Reich from Florida International University in Miami. Yes, sir. Um, I had a question about the you know, private monetary system. Um, how would we transition to it? Um, how could that be locally acceptable? How could that come about? And what would a marketplace all right. Um, first, I don't have all the transition answers. That, that is an academic issue that needs to be had. But I would just remind everybody, we had a private banking system for a long time. <laughs> we had two failed central banks. We had a very successful private banking system, largely private banking system from about 1870 to 1913. It worked very, very well. What happens in that system, the government does establish some monetary value in which it's going to pay its debt. But it doesn't, that's not the only currency that's possible in the marketplace. So banks issue their own currency based on their own financial uh, well-being. Well um, so now, politically today, there's not, there's not much serious discussion about getting rid of the Federal Reserve. But I will remind everybody, 15 years ago, there was no discussion about getting rid of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae because I was part of the process trying to get rid of them. Today, at least there's serious discussion, and I think we possibly will get rid of them. 
two weeks ago at Wake Forest, the BB&T program sponsored a, a, a conference of the best monetary economists and economic historians in the U.S. on the issue of was the Fed a good idea. Some of them thought it was a good idea. A lot of them thought it was a very bad idea. There's serious academic discussion for the first time in my 40-year career that maybe the Fed is really a destructive influence. And a lot of them think what's happening today with this QE2 is extremely dangerous and, and, and sets us up for another really big problem five, ten year, years down the road. So when you start getting an academic discussion and a serious look at, at whether the Fed's been helpful or not, the reason the, the Fed has to not be successful, and this goes back to this whole idea that a group of elite people sitting in the back room can integrate all the information from the global marketplace. They simp there's nobody smart enough to do that. It can't work. Setting price, fixing prices has failed, in and the Fed will admit this. I, in fact, I had the regional president of the Fed uh, from Richmond was at the BB&T board this week, and I asked him, I said, do you believe in price fixing? And he said no. Well, then I said, well, what about fixing the price of money? And he kind of said, well, that's different. <laughs> but I thought that was interesting because the most single important price in the economy is the, is the price of money. It drives investment decisions. And you have a group of experts trying to make that price who admit they, you couldn't, I, you know, they, could, they would say, well, I can't establish the price of bread or I can't establish the price of, of clothes, but somehow I can know what the price of money is. And, and so that's why I bet a market solution will ultimately be better. And I... I, th I think I wouldn't be surprised in 10 or 15 years we'd get rid of the Fed. I don't, I don't know what the process will be because it has been really destructive. Yes, sir. Robert Jeffrey, Yes, sir. Uh, I had a question. Looking at the financial terminal that led to the Fed appropriating a vast amount of residential and commercial properties, about what percentage of the national total of those properties uh, were appropriated and about how long would it take to redistribute those properties back I guess you're talking about the bonds the Fed has bought. Is that, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I, I, Are you talking about Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae? I'm not clear which one you're. Well, the, the actual, there's federal entities uh, you know, throughout multiple states that actually hold you know, commercial properties, whether it be a shopping center or you know, what, what have you, residential properties that they're slowly auctioning off piecemeal. And well, I'm curious, you know, there seems to be no report that they, how much they're holding and how long it will take to redistribute back to the private sector. I don't know what the Fed holds. I think, that, to my knowledge, all the Fed holds is bonds. Some of these bonds are backed by residential properties and, and commercial properties. I, I say the Fed because I don't know the, the Okay. Well, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae are foreclosing on a whole bunch of stuff, <laughs> and, they're, and they're foreclosing slowly. Uh, and, and this whole effort to slow the foreclosure process, which has been saved the homeowners, has actually been very destructive to get in the market clearing price. If you, want, if you want home ownership to re rebound, you've got to find the bottom. And then, then home ownership prices will come back. And as long as they're slowing down the clearing process, which they've done in multiple ways, they're slowing the correction process. And we've never had a serious economic recovery, at least in, in the 20th century to, up to the 21st century, without housing rebounding. So we've got to find the floor on housing in order to get the kind of economic recovery that uh, creates uh, low unemployment. And so Freddie and Fannie moving slow. Congress messing around, states messing around with the whole clearing process hurts the market, hurts the marketplace. Last question. Last question. Sorry. Matt Houston, I'm part of the embattled conservative minority at Columbia Law School. <laughs> 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 I have to make two apologies for my question, just my question is asked. First, it's going to be in purely economic terms. So like a lot of people who studied economics have more or less lost the ability to talk on any other terms. Although I guess I'm going to get a speak like a lawyer. <laughs> Uh, secondly, it's going to be a slightly narrow question, less about a uh, regulatory question, which has a particular kind of credo analysis, and more with some of the comments you made toward the end about particular regimes of wealth redistribution, Medicare, universal health care, that kind of thing. Your criticism for those type of programs took two, took two uh, routes. One, uh, the fallacy of free lunch analysis, and secondly, about uh, the rights of, of one's ownership over, over their productive value. That's, that only works, that does, it's only helpful now once you know who is or is not productive and where that, those rights affect. So I wanted to ask an ex-ante question. If, say, there are 10 people who all know that there's a 10% chance that they themselves or, or their children will be 
productive, such that they'll have this property or ownership rights over, over the value of their production. And each of them agree together that they trade their right to their expected wealth, should they be the, the productive person. They sell that to buy the right that whoever ends up being the productive person will say, agree to pay for universal health care for the other nine. Given the economic realities of risk aversion and diminishing marginal utility of wealth, could it be the case, and I wonder if I could use this in case this, could it be the case that the society would be better from an ex ante perspective making that sort of mutual promise? And that would, of course, go also against the free lunch because you only get that promise by selling your opportunity to say be X plus Y wealthy. I'd have to think about all that. <laughs> um, there's a lot of premises in there. It's so disconnected from the real world. Um, <laughs> um, um, I, I guess you could, as long as it was voluntary, you could you could think of a model like that. But, it, but it would, you would hope it would have some connection to reality. For and I, I, don't, I don't, I'm having a hard time making that connection. So, <laughs> interesting question. Thank you very much. Thank you.